The Senator from Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm on the floor today to ask for unanimous consent from my colleagues uh, to proceed to H.R. 8. The House passed bipartisan comprehensive background checks bill. And I want to tell you why I'm making this request. I understand the low likelihood of success. But I hope many of my colleagues took a minute to watch cell phone video from the school shooting in Michigan yesterday, on Tuesday, excuse me. Absolutely terrifying to watch. In real time, children fleeing their classroom in fear that their lives were about to be ended. 100 911 calls came in to the police during the shooting. Surveillance footage reportedly shows the gunman entering a bathroom with a backpack, then exiting a minute later without the backpack, but with a handgun. He then started firing at students, and when they started to run, he, quote, methodically and deliberately walked down the hallway and aimed his gun into classroom and at students who were unable to escape. We think about the damage done in the number of lives lost, four so far, and those that were injured, but really the damage is so much broader because all of those kids who fleed that violence, all of those kids who now don't think of school as a safe place, they are going through trauma and will go through trauma that may take a lifetime to address. feel school is a safe place any longer, who don't think their neighborhoods are a safe place any longer, who grow up in parts of this country in which everyday gun violence is routine. They don't believe they'll live past the age of 25. The damage happening across this country is acute. It is real. It is pervasive. This is an epidemic of gun violence that exists in the United States and nowhere else. The risk, though, is that this country thinks about gun violence only when there is a mass shooting or only when there is a shooting at a school. On Tuesday, the same day that the country was captivated by these terrifying images out of Oxford High School, in Taylor, Texas, four bodies were found at a home in that town after an apparent murder-suicide. Police said that Anthony Davis, 57-year-old, shot and killed his wife, his wife's stepchild, uh, and the stepchild's romantic acquaintance. Four people dead in Taylor, Texas. Nobody knows about that nationally. Nobody knows about the other 50 to 100 people who died of gun violence on Tuesday. This happens every single day in this country at a rate 10 times higher than any other country in the high-income world. It only happens in the United States of America, and we let it happen as a body. We let it happen as a body because it is not that we are unlucky in the United States. This is a policy choice that we make. And let's be honest, the reason that we can't get anything done in the Senate is not because there is a disagreement amongst our constituents about what to do. Our constituents, Republicans and Democrats, support measures like universal background checks. In fact, there's almost nothing in the political world that enjoys such high support as universal background checks. 80, 90 percent of Americans, the majority of Republicans, Democrats, gun owners, non-gun owners, support universal background checks. But we can't get it done because it seems as if Many of my colleagues here care more about the health of the gun industry and their profits than they do about the health of our kids. Gun industry profits are being put ahead of the safety of my children, of our children. Shooting after shooting, Republicans in this body have refused to do anything meaningful that would reduce this pace of carnage, both in our schools but on the streets of America. And as I said, it's not as if we don't know what the answer is. Let me give you a remarkable statistic. So in 2020, we saw a pretty substantial increase in violent crime all across the country. That increase was about 5%, and a lot of that was gun crime. Gun crime went up by 25%. 
during 2020. But let's break down that number between the states that have universal background checks and the states that don't have universal background checks. 5% overall increase in violent crime in the United States. But in 2020, in states that did not have and don't have universal background checks, meaning you can, a criminal can get a gun at a gun show or online without any background check. In those states, violent crime went up 8%, higher than the national average. What about the states like Connecticut that have universal background checks, where we make sure everybody gets a background check before they buy a gun? In those states, violent crime went up in 2020 by less than 1%. That's pretty stunning. On a percentage basis, violent crime goes up by eight times the level in states without universal background checks as in states with universal background checks. And, and I can just run through the litany of studies that show the difference in murder rates and gun crime between states that have universal background checks and those that don't. One of the most recent studies from 2019, a Harvard study, shows a 15% difference. Now, that's surprising because no matter how strong Connecticut's background checks law is, States that don't have background checks um, end up allowing people to buy guns there and they come into Connecticut. So until we have a national requirement that everybody go through a background check before, at the very least they buy a gun in a commercial sale, then there's nothing that Connecticut can do to, to, to make itself completely immune to the epidemic of illegal guns. So that's why we're on the floor today, myself, Senator Blumenthal and Senator Durbin. Uh, to ask our colleagues to pass into law a bipartisan piece of legislation that has already passed the House of Representatives. Uh, this is a bill that would expand background checks to all sales in this country, with certain exceptions for transfers between immediate family members. This is a bill, as I mentioned, that is supported by the vast majority of Americans, one of the most popular policy proposals that exists in this country today, and it will save lives. I mentioned the shooting in Texas because one of the critiques of this proposal often is, well, it wouldn't have stopped the last mass shooting. I don't claim that this proposal nor any other proposal to change the nation's gun laws will have an effect on every single shooting, but the data is the data, the statistics are the statistics, and this proposal is the most impactful when a state takes it. Universal background checks save lives, decreases gun violence, decreases violent crime, and the loss of life when it's a shooting on the streets of New Haven, one person being shot, um, that is just as shattering to the lives of the people who love that victim as is a mass shooting. And so I am hopeful that the Senate will make the decision today to pass this bill into law. I understand the chances are slim to none that this unanimous consent request will be adopted, but I am at my wit's end. I'm at my wit's end. And so I'm prepared to use whatever means I have as an individual senator to come down here and try to press this case forward. So I will ask at this point, knowing the senator from Iowa is on the floor, um, as if in legislative session, I would request unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.R. 8, the Bipartisan Background Checks Act of 2021, which was received from the House. Further, that the bill be considered read a third time and passed and that the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Mr. Mr. President. The Senator from <clears throat> Iowa. Reserving the right to object, and I'd like to give some remarks, <clears throat> I want to start off with a process question to the all 100 senators. Obviously, this is an important issue with a lot of people. Democrats control every committee in this body. And, uh, and uh, this bill is being offered when it could be brought up in the committee under regular order because they control the agendas of, uh, in this case, the Judiciary Committee. So why hasn't that come up? Then I would remind people in 2013 that we actually had a vote 
on a grassley cruise amendment uh, that got the most votes uh, so far of any uh, gun issues uh, in, I think, the year 2013. So now let's get to the issue that uh, was brought up today by the senator from Connecticut. And let me say that uh, we've got to have real regard for the position he takes because of the tragedy that happened in his state in 2012. Uh, nobody's going to justify that, or I'd, uh, if they did, uh, they would be uh, cr crazy for trying to say that something bad like that happened, that it's not a crisis for everybody. So let me start off by saying, in regard to what happened in Michigan, the senseless tragedy that we saw in that state should not have happened. The shooter, as we've been told, killed four and injured others in a shocking act of violence. I cannot imagine what those families of victims are going through, because I guess you'd have to go through it to try to get their feeling about it. You see it expressed on television, but it doesn't make the same impact on the people that are listening that makes on the family of the victims. Difficult topics require across the aisle conversations, particularly when you have to have 60 votes to get anything done in this body. And I'd invite my colleagues across the aisle to have a bipartisan conversation on this topic and a lot of related topics to it. Violent crime and violence at schools are serious problems. I've supported legislative efforts to improve the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, which we call NICS. For example, I introduced the Eagles Act, a bipartisan bill that would help reauthorize the U.S. Secret Service's National Threat Assessment Center, where they study targeted violences and proactively identify and manage threats before they result in tragedies. However, in regard to the motion before us, I have serious concerns with a bill raised by the senator from Connecticut. This bill is hostile towards lawful gun owners and lawful firearm transactions. Uh, this will not solve the problems that it seeks to solve. So-called co so universal background checks will not prevent crime and will turn otherwise law-abiding citizens into criminals. I've introduced legislation along with Senator Cruz and Dillis called Protecting Communities and Preserving the Second Amendment Act. Our bill will be much more effective than the underlying bill and has been supported by a majority of the Senate uh, in the past. And I think that's the same thing that I was referring to, a vote that got a majority but not 60 votes in 2013. But the Democrat leadership has blocked that approach, which I assume that they will do again today. This legislation, S1775, would reauthorize and improve NICS, increase resources for prosecution of gun crime, and address mental illness in the criminal justice system, which if it had been addressed properly, in the case of the Parkland, Florida shooting, that individual that had been identified, I think somewhere between 30 and 40 times as having very serious mental issues. And uh, he, if he had been identified, uh, he would have been in the NICS system and not be able to buy that gun. And uh, that's just one thing, mental illness being a problem. And this legislation would also strengthen criminal law by including straw purchasing and illegal firearms uh, trafficking statutes. It does that without burdening any Second Amendment rights of Americans. In addition, this bill would require a commission to study and report to Congress the underlying causes and triggers for mass shootings. The commission and study proposal uh, could not come at a more important time. 
and I urge my colleagues to support uh, this legislation that I will suggest to the Senate on a UC request. Therefore, Mr. President, I object to uh, the motion that you've asked UC on. Objection is heard. Mr. President. Senator from Connecticut. Mr. President, I, I know the Senator has um, his own UC request. I, I will just say two things very quickly. I'm uh, not surprised, but still disappointed uh, in the objection. Um, I uh, take the Senator's uh, advice seriously. We need 60 votes in order to pass legislation uh, like uh, HR 8 before this body. Um, but I think, as the Senator knows, um, with Senator Durbin's guidance, uh, I've been involved in multiple rounds of talks with Republican senators throughout the year about trying to find some common ground. I think anyone who has been part of those talks knows that I've been willing to bend, I've been willing to compromise. Um, I'm not going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to saving lives. And if the senator is making an offer to, um, to join those talks or to, or to sit down, then um, count me in. Um, uh, but so far, uh, a year into uh, maybe the most deadly year uh, in my political lifetime with respect to gun violence, I haven't been able to find one Republican taker uh, for a compromise uh, on the issue of background checks. And then I will gladly send to the senator the, the, the reams of data showing that background checks, in fact, do make a difference. Um, as I cited, just in 2020, we see the difference between states that have background checks and those that don't. Um, and I look forward to continuing that conversation. I would yield the floor. President. Senator from Iowa. Uh, as if in legislative session, I would ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number 62, which is S-1775, the Protecting Communities and Preserving the Second Amendment Act of 2021, further that the bill be considered read a third time and passed, and that the motion to reconsider uh, be made and laid upon the table. Is there objection? Mr. President. Senator from Connecticut. Uh, reserving the right to object, um, let me concede that there um, are some laudable pieces to this legislation. It's not new to the body, as uh, Senator Grassley mentioned. This is something that has received a vote. Um, but in large part, it is a massive contraction of the universal background check system um, rather than what Americans support, which is an expansion of the background check system. And let me give you just two examples. Um, in this legislation, um, there would be a change in law made such that for individuals who are subject to psychiatric confinement, the minute they leave that confinement, they get their gun rights restored. That's not the existing law. The existing law says that if you are so mentally ill that you have had to be inpatient, um, you don't get those gun rights restored unless you petition. Second, this bill would say that for individuals who have been judged mentally incompetent, this is a this is a regulatory term, not my term, but a, for individuals who have been determined mentally incompetent by a federal government agency, they would have their gun rights restored. Right now, those individuals are not allowed to possess guns, but they would under this proposal. So uh, this amendment, while it has some, I think, important pieces to it, um, in large part is a pretty massive contraction of the number of background checks that would be done in this country. And uh, for that reason, uh, I would object. Objection is heard. Uh, I made the request, so there isn't any objection, so my bill passes. No, objection was heard. He oh, did object. Objection is heard. Before I give up the floor, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, suggest that uh, we could start sitting down with the Senator for Connecticut and a lot of other senators that are interested in this issue, both on the, on the Republican side and the Democrat side, with uh, the legislation that I've suggested. Uh, the other thing I'd like to comment on, just to clarify the senator's statement about the recapture of gun rights under our bill, uh, he's right, but you got to look at why those Second Amendment rights were taken away in the first place. And I think it's the same principle. It applies to people that have gone through the Social Security system and the people that have gone through the VA system. That as simple as a little thing, that you've got to have a third party 
uh, handle your finances for your family or whatever finances you are. You gotta have a third party to do it. That name gets put in the NIC system. And it shouldn't be there just because you can't handle your finances. That's got nothing to do that you ought to be denied your Second Amendment rights. And uh, so our legislation provides a process to make sure that the due process of the Second Amendment rights that have been denied can be recaptured so they can have the Bill of Rights as was intended. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Connecticut. Thanks, Mr. President. I wish I could end this exchange on a hopeful note. I've come here so many times wishing that an exchange like this one could lead to progress. And we've offered again and again and again the senator from Connecticut on background checks, myself on red flag or emergency risk orders, on Ethan's law with safe storage, on a myriad of proposals to sit down with our colleagues and engage in the kind of constructive and positive dialogue that Senator Grassley has suggested. And they've yielded nothing. And the reason they've yielded nothing is essentially that, unfortunately, our Republican colleagues remain in the grip of a lobby, the gun lobby, which is waning in its impact across the country, but still maintains its grip in this chamber. That's the grip we need to break. That's the grip that will be break, broken through the Democratic process if the American people have their way. And the American people are changing in their view. In fact, there is now a political movement. It is composed of the young people, March for Our Lives, who suffered in Parkland, Florida, when they saw the same kind of shooting and suffered the same kind of trauma that those students did in Oakland County, Michigan. And again and again and again, this tragedy has been repeated in schools across our country. We are here again in grief and sorrow for the lives taken by gun violence needlessly and violently for young people Madison Baldwin, 17, Justin Schilling, 17, Hannah St. Juliana, 14, Tate Meyer, 16, shot multiple times, as my colleague from Connecticut has described it in that video, among many others trying to escape. Six other students and a teacher were injured, and their community is reeling from this horror, a horror of blood and flesh and lives cut short forever. And their loved ones have joined a club, as it has been called, a club nobody wants to join. Nobody wants to be admitted. In just 12 days, just 12 days from now, it will be the ninth anniversary of a tragedy whose survivors joined that club, the families of the Sandy Hook children, 20 beautiful, innocent children, and six dedicated, courageous educators at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. And whenever I talk about this subject in this chamber, I see them in the gallery. I see them in the gallery on the day that we failed. We failed by just a handful of votes to reach the 60 that we needed to pass a background check proposal. And one of them shouted, shame, shame. And it was shameful and disgraceful that we failed to act 
on that day. Think of how many lives we could have saved. You know, in this body, we talk endlessly. And sometimes we act in a way that can affect real lives and real people. We could have saved real lives and real people on that day. Not all the lives lost to gun violence, the tens of thousands who have perished since then, but some of them. When you save one life, you save the world, is an adage in my faith. We had it within our grasp to save lives and to help save the world. But we failed then, and again today, we failed, even with the impetus of that horror in our minds and before us played again and again. And for me, the voices of those survivors resonate their faces are forever with me, as they will be for all who knew the survivors of the Oakland, Michigan tragedy. They've become friends. They have become almost members of my family. And they relive their own tragedy when they see what happened in these shootings. And the trauma affects not just children in that school on Tuesday. It affects children everywhere. Somebody said to me the other day, you know, the three best words in the English language these days, back to normal. We want to go back to normal after a year and a half of the pandemic, we want to go back to normal, could put kids back in school, put teachers back in the classroom, back to normal. We are back to normal in gun violence. In fact, we are worse than normal. We are back to normal with school shootings because kids are back in school. The rate of gun violence has, if anything, explosively increased. This normal cannot be normalized. It cannot be made the new normal. The banality of evil cannot be taken for granted. The shame that that vote nine years ago brought to this body is a stain that will forever haunt us and haunts us evermore when we fail, as we did today, to provide real action. And there isn't any panacea. My colleague from Connecticut is absolutely right. No single proposal is the solution. And there are others that we've advanced and tried to make a matter of bipartisan support. Senator Graham and I have worked on a red flag or emergency risk protection order statute that separates people from guns when they are dangerous to themselves or others, separates them when they are under a protective order and they buy those guns, or when a family member knows they're about to commit or take their own lives, not to mention other people's lives. More than half of all the gun deaths in this country are suicide. We can save those lives. A large number of these deaths occur when children are playing with guns in their own homes because the guns have been unsafely stored Ethan Song was killed in Connecticut because a parent failed to safely store a gun. Ethan's law requiring safe storage would save lives. 
holding manufacturers accountable and depriving them of the sweetheart deal that led to PLACA, giving them immunity from any legal accountability. Reversing that immunity would help to save lives in repealing PLACA. There are more than one proposal that we need to seriously consider if we're going to have the kind of dialogue that my colleague, Senator Grassley, suggested. But the simple fact is the House of Representatives did its job back in March when it passed that bipartisan legislation to expand background checks. We're trying to do our job today, seeking unanimous consent from our colleagues to move forward on H.R. 8. And there is no rational explanation, none, when the vast majority of American people, gun owners, as well as NRA members, all backgrounds, all walks of life, all geographic areas, all demographic areas support this measure. So back to normal. We're back to normal. We cannot tolerate this normal. And as we approach that ninth anniversary of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, and I recall that bleak day in December when we gathered at a firehouse with parents who were waiting to find out, waiting to know whether their children were still alive. No matter what the ages of our children I have four, we can relive that moment in our own minds, in our own hearts. And we can see in this gallery those parents who came to speak truth to us, speak truth to power. and who will call us to account. The American people should call us to account for our failure to act today, our complicity in those deaths. This Congress is complicit. The members who vote against these measures are complicit in the tragedies that follow. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.